This conference will now be recorded. Vande Vanchita Labhaya Karmata Kim Tanna Kathyate Kim Dampati Miti Bruyam Utaho Dampati Iti. That is a Mangala Shloka of this. Um, we're starting Nilakanta Vijay Champu uh, by Nilakanta Dikshita. Um, let me give you a background of what a Kavyam is um, and then go on to what a Champu is so that you have an idea of it. Uh, so Kavyam is uh, basically divided into um, Kavyam is divided into two, Drishyam and Shravya Kavya. And here you have, uh, see Drishya Kavyam is basically that which we can see and Shravya Kavyam is that which we can hear, that which is suitable for hearing. That is what is the broad classification that we always do for Kavyams, right? First, what is Kavyam? There are many uh, um, definitions for Kavyam. You have over the years, Alankarikas, that is the, the Sahitya Shastra, people who have written about the rules of Kavya have given different definitions for Kavyas. They've said Ishtartha, um, uh, whatever I wish to convey, the, it should be conveyed in a uh, 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 in a set of words with its meaning. Right? The, uh, a series of pada avali, padanam avalihi, a string of words which have been connected to each other to in order to give the ishtartha, whatever is the meaning that the poet wishes to convey. That is one, that is how Kavya Darsha's Dandin starts off with it. Because for him, Shabda is very important. Shabda is the base for communication. Uh, otherwise, this whole world, he says uh, very beautifully, idam, idam andam tamakritsnam jayeta bhuvanatrayam yadi shabdahvayam jyotihi asamsaram adityate. This entire world will be completely in darkness if the, the light of shabda, the communication, you can't take it as just a word. It's that communication. If that communication is lost, if you don't have that light, then this whole world will be uh, submerged in darkness. You can't write from the morning if you think about it. Every little step is prompted and every little step can go to the next step only because of communication. Right? So you need Shabda and that Shabda should convey an Artha when these two combine together in a beautiful manner. So that is where people started refining the definition that Dandi gave for a Kavya, which is Ishtartha Vyavachinna Padavali. It is not just conveying what you wish to convey. That is not what it, a Kavyam is. Then whatever I'm saying now will become a Kavyam, right? But that is not what a, a poetry or a work of literature is. A work of literature is more, has something more than just the words and meaning. It needs beauty. Okay. Only when a beauty is associated to it, there is a, uh, a you can you can uh, uh, appreciate and passionately enjoy what is given before. Right, that is how a kavyam should be. So when people started refining these the the definition of kavya, they came up with I'm, I, I think around the 14th century, Sahitya uh, Darpanakara uh, Vishwanatha Kavi came up with the definition that Vakim Rasatmakam Kavya. Why I take that definition is I like it very much more than any, any other person's uh, definition. Any Vakyam, any statement which is Rasatmakam, which has a Rasa in it, is called Kavya. So then this Kavyam is divided into Drishya and Shravya. Drishyam is that Darshana Yogyam. So actually Alankarikas only define Drishyam uh, and uh, only Rupaka or Nataka dramas as Drishya Kavya and Shravya Kavya is Gadya Padya and Champu. That's how they have defined it. M my uh, guru would say that any Kavyam, any Kavyam which has the capability of staging, if you can do a drama of Kumara Sambhava based on the shlokas that are given by Kalidasa, then yes, it becomes, it has the capability of Drishya. It may not have the technical term of Drishya, but it is Darshana Yogya. Hmm? Not just Shrotum Yogya, it is also Darshana Yogya. Right? 
Now, Sharabhyam, let's go by the technical de uh, definitions that the Alankarikas have given. Sharabhyam means that which we can listen, which is Gadhyam, Padhyam and Champu. Gadhyam is prose, Padhyam is poetry and Champu who is a Gadhyam and Padhyam mixed together. That is what we are going to study today. Right? So this Gadhyam has no meter, but there are rules for Gadhya. It can be either a Katha, Akhyaika. There are also stylistic differences that can uh, um, uh, come into play in a Gadhyam in prose. And Padhyam has meter, as you know, there are uh, right from uh, four, two syllables in a Pada to 21 or even more. It depends on the uh, uh, Kavi's, uh, uh, you know, uh, Shakti. He can make however, how much ever bigger Padhyas that he can. You can come with different types of combinations. The Vritta, the meter that you use in a Padhyam, uh, uh, with permutations and combinations, there can be millions of meters that can you uh, that a kavi can use. And uh, um, if you look at Vrataratnakaram, it is a study by itself uh, to study the meters that are involved in Padhya. Now, Padhya, uh, uh, Padhya Kavya also has different varieties. You have Mahakavya, Laghu Kavya, Khanda Kavyam, um, uh, didactic poets, stu poems, stutis, stotra literature. If you take every uh, uh, classification of Gadhyam, uh, not Gadhyam, I would say Padhyam has a more variety uh, in it than Gadhyam because Gadhyam is a very, very difficult uh, style to adopt and write. That is why you have very few Gadhya Kavyas today. Right? Uh, Padhyam has many classifications. Now we come to Champu, which has, which has taken the good aspects of both you know it's like a child who has both the father's aspect and the mother's aspect in it it's like it should come as a uh, as a combination of both it should come underneath gadhya and padhya is what i feel so it's like the child who takes both characteristics of the father and the mother so champu if you look at the definitions of uh, uh, champu kavyam gadhya padhyamayi kachit champurit abhidiyate that's kavya darsha dandin's uh, uh, definition he says gadhyam padhyamayi kachit the, the word itself the kachit means it's uh, anirvachaniya you cannot describe the beauty that is there in champu because it has all the beautiful aspects of gadhya and the beautiful aspects of Padya, when you bring both together, it's like listening to an uh, ensemble on stage. See, each instrument has a different beauty in it. If you look at Murdanga, you look at a concert. Let's go to a concert and you see the vocal alone. If you listen to it, it will be beautiful. Right. Accept it. Then you would listen to violin. It is again beautiful. Mridanga, that is also nice. But if all these come together and the words, the sahityam and everything, then that combination is beyond the three separate things. Right? In a kavyam, just like how you take each and every word, you write the meaning, you write anvaya, pratipadartha, bhava. Only when you come to the bhavartha, you understand the, the combination of the words and the meaning give rise to something beyond the sharira of the padhyam, right? That is how this is. So each one has its beauty, but when they come together, it is it is got an alaukika uh, saundaryam. That is kachit. Kachit champuhu ityabhidiyate. Kachit gadhya padhyamayi champur ityabhidiyate. That's the first definition that he gives. Uh, the most famous champu and most read champu is uh, Champu Ramanam. Gadhyanubandha rasamishrita padhya suktihi hridya. That's uh, uh, Boja's definition of uh, champu. Uh, he uses that, uh, what is that? Vadya. Uh, it's like a Vadya Kalava. Uh, Vidya hi Vadya Kalaya Kalite. Uh, Ah, Kaliteva Geetihi, right? Vadya Kalaya Kaliteva Geetihi. Just like how the instruments come together and uh, give, uh, uh, embellish the uh, song. That is how uh, Champu is. So he says, Gadhya Anubandha Rasa Mishrita. 
gadya anubandha it is connected with gadyam uh, rasa mishrita along with rasam padya sukti the, the padyam also should give out rasam okay so gadya padya gadya anubandha mishrita rasa mishrita padya sukti now you have the padyamshas which are guna alankara riti um, etc uh, padyamsha also is there the gadyamshas are also there so gadyam the different parts of a gadyam are you have uh, even though you don't have meter there are certain rules like when there is a description you have a long samasa when there is a conversation you have smaller passages because it is natural that nobody is going to talk in uh, uh, long long compounds right it's very difficult to think like that and say long compounds when you are talking so it's easier if the conversation is very small and uh, um, uh, uh, concise those aspects are also found in champu because essentially it is the gadya portions are gadya the same way padya portions also have whatever you will find in a mahakavya what are all the aspects that you will find in a mahakavya all those you are going to find it in the padya portions of the champu also and uh, if you look at the history of champu uh, vedas have both the gadya portion and the padya portion if you look at the upanishads or uh, uh, even actually i think rigveda has more only padyam and uh, uh, yajurveda has more of uh, gadyam prose uh, samaveda of course is only the uh, it has more of the uh, rigveda portions because it is a geeti form uh, it's it's sung samaveda is sung more than uh, recited hmm? Uh, of course, Itihasa and Purana they have Itihasam. Ramayana is completely padyam. There are no gadya portions in Ramayana, whereas Mahabharata has both gadya and padyam. Puranas you have uh, Vishnu Purana is uh, I think only padyam if I remember right. Bhagavatam has a lot of gadyas in it, so it, it is mixed there. But it took a beautiful form only during the classical period. if you look at the vedic and purana period they were only interested in conveying whatever message they wanted to convey okay the purpose of vedas was to give an order to the uh, um, uh, uh, people who are reading it you have to do this you should not do this if you do this you will get this uh, uh, merit satyanna pramaditavyam usually if you do if you say a lie this is the uh, uh, um, papam that you you are going to enjoy so it is it is very clear that vedas talk like a an overlord ordering his servant whereas itihasa and purana uh, they say ramadivat vartitavyam na tu ravanadivat it, it advises like a uh, friend uh, i think uh, in pratapurudriyam he says yad veda prabhu samhitat you must yeah, i think you will read it later yet vedat prabhu samhitat just like veda is like how our lord orders whereas in itihasa is like a friend which gives you an advice not uh, uh, he is not going to cajole you into doing the right thing right a friend will just say see if you do this you are going to end up like this person if you do this you are going to end up like this person why do you want to go in the wrong path that's that is how a friend is going to tell you whereas a kavyam is like a lady who beautifully tries to bring the man or the child into the right path you look at how a mother approaches a child she says you know it's it, why don't you do this i will give you this chocolate i will give you that i'll give you this you have all these you know um uh, treats and these things and try to get them into a nice it's called the sugar coated way right so that is how a kavyam is kanta samhitataya upadesha yuje kanta how a lady will beautifully bring the man into the right path uh, um, showing him the beauty that is there more than anything and not even showing the uh, uh, other how do i say it is he she uses the rasas the different nine different rasas that you see to bring the man into the right path that is kavya's work so only when it came to the classical period champu attained a beauty there and the first uh, uh, person who 
came up with the classical champu literature was Na- trivikrama bhatta he wrote the nala champu um there are several champu uh, kavyams that came up later and it's only in 17th century we, we that we have nilakantha vijay champu just before that you have the vishwagunatha Ch- champu which is also very close in time uh, actually for a more detailed uh, introduction about the itihasa and everything you should uh, look at uh, saumya krishnapur's uh, champu ramayana balakandam it's very good uh, she's got a nice uh, introduction for champu so in 17th century just before that you find vishwagunatha champu uh, the other three if you see nala champu champu ramayanam bharata champu yashastilaka champu and all these things are based on itihasa uh, and purana uh, itihasa more more than purana it is based on itihasa vishwagunatha champu is one which is uh, very different in its character where it shows the Uh, geographical nature of india beautifully this arya aryavarta he describes the aryavarta through two vidyadharas to gandharva they both are traveling and they are describing the uh, area and it describes the political scene at that point of time i think during 16th end of 16th century or something like that uh, it is more relevant uh, to understand the uh, social political conditions that were there in india at that point of time nilakanta dikshita is sort of a revival of the old uh, uh, tradition of champu where he goes back to the puranas and takes the story and writes about uh, um, uh, uh, the samudra mathanam it's a very novel idea as such the the um, bijam of the story that he takes is very novel because nobody has taken it before and he looks at it from the point of uh, shiva in the sense he Uh, he thinks he he talks of shiva as the hero of the entire samudra mathanam is as if shiva had not taken that hala hala visham and uh, you know drank it uh, the, the devas would have suffered nobody was even willing to go there in fact in the second shloka he says people just ran off they were the moment kaustaba mani and everything came up they were saying okay you you want to have this i want to have this you want to have this and they were fighting about it but then when this hala hala visham came uh, they all ran in all directions and it was shiva who came there and say mahabhishta don't worry let me take care of it okay so the he thinks he he uh, establishes that shiva is the hero there so uh, if you look at the lalankara shastram they say a, a kavyam should have a hero and the hero should have all these lakshanas right so the nayaka lakshanas that you talk about kula and everything nobody can be a better nayaka than shiva is what his personal belief and it's it's ishta devata and it's natural that nilakanta wants to portray uh, the nilakanta dikshita wants to take to shiva as the um, uh, hero of this kavya right so let me give a little bit background about nilakanta dikshita a very interesting character i i was so amazed by the variety of texts that he has written which are completely different from what uh, um, earlier uh, authors have written right uh, let's go with first get uh, uh, his um, uh, parichaya away so that we can go to the text as such hmm? um he was a tamil nadu person so he was born in tamil nadu there are three areas where people say okay nilakanta dikshita is mine uh, you know the districts right so the first one is the kanchipuram district uh, the gramam is adeyapalam uh, where his uh, uh, birth took place adeyapalam is more famous the, it was first famous for appe dikshita and appe dikshita is a giant as far as grammar sahityam um uh id uh, kavyam goes is a giant vedanta of course I, how can i forget that if whether it is advaita or shivadvaita or shatam or uh, uh, um sahitya shastram he is a giant nobody can i mean uh, if during the alankara shastra if you look at the sahitya shastram history if there has been a unique or if there has been some contribution after dhvanikara it is only i would say 
either uh, rasaganga dinakara that is uh, pandita jagannatha or uh, ape dikshita because they've contributed so much to the field and of course the field of advaita also where he had to establish uh, um, a supremacy of advaita over vishishta advaita that was his uh, time when he uh, was there it was i think uh, 16th century for late yeah 15th century no 16th century end and beginning of something like that and uh, the next place so that is where uh, nilakanta dikshita was born and he apparently lived there about for about 12 years and uh, uh, then he moved to madurai um, he was uh, tirumala nayaka was the ruler there and he was a mantri there so a, s- a certain amount of his service period was there and then he retired in tirunelveli district uh, palavadai uh, he spent the end of uh, less, rest of his years there right now his i if you look at his ancestry nilakanta dikshita it, it's a family of scholars and i told you about ape dikshita he nilakanta dikshita is actually ape dikshita's brother's uh, son's son so uh, nilakanta ape dikshita's brother is achan dikshita and uh, his son i think is narayana dikshita whose the son is nilakanta dikshita uh, ape dikshita was such a great person uh, i don't want this lecture to be about apay dikshita otherwise if i start on that it's a different topic by itself uh, i have to say a few things you know why the entire clan of apay dikshita is extremely gifted in that manner he is uh, uh, a force to reckon with you know he is also a person who was um, who lived like a saint and at the, he also had the sakshatkaram of nataraja at the end actually he he describes he says when can i ever see shiva's uh, feet he wants to go to chidambaram and die there so at that point of time he he travels to chidambara on his way he actually says when can i ever see his feet you know na kinchi da ham arthaye shivapadam didrikshaye param i want to see his feet uh, at that point of time shiva comes and gives him the uh, uh, darshanam and he says abhati hataka sabha nataraja padma abhati hataka sabha the nataraja padma the nataraja's feet i can see it and the kanaka sabha is there in front of me jyotirmayo marasine tarunarunoyam jyotirmaya it is completely like a prakasham i can only see uh, jyotis uh, uh, light and tarunarunoyam it is not a light which is blinding light it's like the uh, um, sun which is just rising and taruna aruna the, the when the sun is rising it has a very slight reddish color which is so pleasing to the eyes that's why when kids are very young we take them in the morning not in the afternoon when the sun is bright in the morning right not in the afternoon so we take in the early morning sun is very good for the child right so that is he describes it like that so tarunarunoyam and that's it if this is the first half of the shloka ఆభాతి హాటక సభ నటరాజ పద్మ జ్యోతిర్మయో మనసిమే తరుణారుణోయం అండ్ హీ స్టాప్స్ బికాస్ హీ ఇస్ నో మోర్ హీ డైస్ అట్ దట్ పాయింట్ ఆఫ్ టైమ్ హిస్ స్టూడెంట్స్ అండ్ హిస్ గ్రాండ్ చిల్డ్రన్ హూ ఆర్ బిసైడ్ హిమ్ కంప్లీట్ దట్ శ్లోక సే నూనం జరా మరణ ఘోర పిశాచ కీర్ణ సంసార మోహ రజని విరతిం ప్రయాత ఇట్స్ డెఫినెట్లీ jara marana ghora the samsara moha rajani the night of na when a sun comes up the night goes right and here they compare the night to the samsara that is his life uh, he he must have uh, he has crossed that uh, circle of janma and punar janma that's the line that they complete na no? so, jara marana ghora pishacha kirna samsara moha rajani viratim prayata it is completely gone so from this shloka if you see it just shows that apay dikshita has a, a had the sakshatkaram of uh, uh, nataraja and uh, the 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 punyam that he had attained has extended to the entire clan that's what i feel <laughs> anyway because when uh, he was alive he asks everybody all his uh, grandchildren and says what do you want i have my entire so the, you know the um, wealth that i have i want to split it among my children or i want to give it to someone 
So Neelakanta Dikshita says, I don't want all your wealth. I only want your wealth of knowledge or something like that. So he was so pleased. Apai Dikshita was so pleased that he blessed Neelakanta and gave him two of his books, which is Devi Mahatmyam and uh, uh, Raghumsha. Uh, so what an Anugraha Neelakanta Dikshita must have had. And that's why he is a prolific writer. He is, of course, a very... Uh, he is a Vayakarana. He has written uh, a Bhashyam for uh, Kayata's Bhashyam. Now, um, Ashtadhyayi, I'll, I'll go to his works uh, uh, next. Mm. Ah, yes. He has written a lot of works. As far as Mahakavyam goes, he has written two works. One is Ganga Avataranam and Shivalila Arnavam. Ganga Avataranam shows the descent of Ganga, where he starts off with Bhagiratha, uh, Bhagiratha's tapas, and then uh, Ganga's descent, Shiva. Uh, again, there also, you know, uh, he he shows that Shiva is his Ishtadevata. Right, so Shiva captures Ganga and all that. So you have all the definitions of a Mahakavya in that Ganga Avataranam and Shiva Leela Arnavam. Shiva Leela Arnavam is more based on Periyapuranam, which is in Tamil. And it has all the different, uh, just like how Krishna has all his Leelas. Whereas Shiva's uh, um, different... Uh, um, Stories are not portrayed much. So this is probably unique in the sense that he has devoted his entire life to extol the, the, uh, the um, actions of Shiva. Right? Then you have a Natakam, Nalacharitam, which is not complete. Uh, his Champu, of course. These are the main big Kavyas. Then Lagu Kavyam, he has written a lot. If you look at uh, just satire, he is a master at sarcasm. His Kali Vidambanam is something that you have to read in your life, which is, I mean, a, a perfect portrayal of what is there even now. Even though it is, it was written in some 17th century, it just shows how the effects of Kali make people dance. Like a Jyotisha or a doctor. Or if you go to a doctor, he will say, you know, uh, we have one, one thing in Tamil that we say, that is, don't think of the black monkey when you want to eat the medicine. So the moment you start eating the medicine, you will start thinking of the black monkey. And so the doctor would say, if you think of the black monkey, then it will not have an effect. Every time you take the medicine, you'll think of the doctor and you'll think of what he said. So the medicine will never have an effect. If it does have an effect, then fine, good. See, so these are the type of small, small, uh, sarcastic and humorous incidents that he will take up and he will write it. That Kali Vedambanam is a beautiful study. You can do it on your own also. It's not very difficult shlokas. All are in Anushtu. Very nice. Uh, Sabharanjana Shatakam is more uh, satire on how the kings behaved at that point of time. And it was not like the olden days of Rama and uh, maybe even Yudhishthira for that matter. These were all kings who, uh, uh, who did not have much... Uh, 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 interest in literature or they were patrons they gave money they but Tirmala Nayaka was not like that huh? uh, uh, even then he will say I think in one of his uh, Kavyams let me remember which, which one was that um, not his Veda ah, Shanti Vilasam right in Shanti Vilasam he says ah, Kaumarat um, Veda Vyasana Vidhina whatever I forget that shloka from young age, from my childhood, I have been studying Veda, Vedanta, Vitihasam, Puranam and Kavyam and everything. All these have just become one, uh, uh, you know, what is this used for? I am only using it to entertain the kings who just lie down at the night and want to listen uh, as a hobby. That is what I have been reduced to. Ah, Katam Paryanam Seet. He finishes that shloka with that. How can I, uh, uh, what is the end for this? Look at the state at which I have been reduced to. Uh, it's just one of the uh, later kavyams. So he has done bhakti kavyas also and Vedanta kavya. I don't need to specifically say bhakti kavyam. It is just that he spent uh, a lesser number of shlokas on that. Otherwise, his Ganga Avataranam or Shivali Larnavam or even this Nilakanta Vijayashampu is completely Bhakti Purva only. I, you don't need to separately say that it's a Bhakti Kavyam. Uh, and then there are uh, a lot of uh, 
manuscripts or printed works in his names you can go through these later of course the most important one is the last one which is the kayeta vyakhyanam uh, kayeta um, kayeta has uh, kayeta has written a bhashyam for mahabhashya and he has written one vyakhyanam commentary on kayeta um, that just why i am highlighting that is just to show that he is a great grammarian so every uh, uh, work of his is always completely free of any um, uh, vyakarana apashadda hmm? there are he is completely vyakarana shuddha hmm? so that's why i wanted to highlight that uh, and this work that we have taken the nilakanta vijay champu has a commentary by mahadeva suri uh, and the work that i have shared i'll give the link underneath also in the description later so that you can download if you have not downloaded it this is a completely uh, um, correct as far as grammar goes uh, there is no vyakarana and the that uh, is in the kutram porul na porul pidai விந்த பிழை அப்படின்போம் தமிழ்ல ஸோ எந்த ஒரு தப்பும் இல்லாத ஒரு ஒர்க் அது இட் ஹேஸ் நோ மிஸ்டேக்ஸ் அஸ் ஃபார் எஸ் கிராமர் கோஸ் தட்ஸ் வை மகாதேவ சூரி ஹூ இஸ் ரிட்டன் த காமெண்ட்ரி ஃபார் திஸ் தி ஓன்லி சோல் காமெண்ட்ரி தட் இஸ் அவைலபிள் ஃபார் நீலகண்ட் விஜயம் ஓகே ஹி ஹஸ் ஸ்பென்ட் டிவோட்டட் கம்ப்ளீட்லி ஆன் எக்ஸ்பிளைனிங் த டெக்ஸ்ட் அண்ட் எக்ஸ்பிளைனிங் த கிராமேட்டிகல் பாயிண்ட்ஸ் இன் த டெக்ஸ்ட் வித் சூத்ரம் அண்ட் எவ்ரி திங் இஃப் யூ ஆர் வெரி இன்ட்ரெஸ்டட் then you should read the commentary completely and try to uh, look at the particular sutra in siddhanta kaumudi and refer and you can actually uh, cover the entire siddhanta kaumudi based on this because he is given extensive uh, sutra references for that the another most important point of that is this text which uh, the link that is given uh, uh, of mahendra suri it was published uh, i mean i think in uh, by the sanskrit education society in 72 the uh, the tippani the one who has published at that point of time was shrivat sankachar who is uh, who was a great grammarian himself we call him sakshat patanjali there is no other word for him you know he is such a great grammarian he would just uh, the moment someone uh, brings a book you know he would say okay turn turn to page 25 i think there is a mistake in the fourth line go there he knows every book every publication along with its mistakes so the first time anybody gets a book he will first do corrections in it that's such a great grammarian he was and he has written tippanis for this uh, uh, commentary where he has added sutras and of course he is very rightly pointed out in his preface that uh, you know this uh, um, commentary lacks in the sense that it does not have any mention of uh, alankara or dhvani uh, and all these things so he has completely omitted that part and only focused on grammar now when you are looking at a kavyam you are only looking at the rasa right and dhvani alankara those are the aspects of a kavya vyakaranam is necessary i am not denying that but you need rasam or dhvani or alankara and all those charcha also so as i uh, uh, proceed in this class i will be highlighting more of those which is not there in the vyakhyanam uh, otherwise you can look at the vyakhyanam for the pratipadartha and everything right i am not going to uh, show the pratipadartham here because the vyakhyanam is very self explanatory this is one of his earlier works not as early as gangavatarnam or shivalila arnavam where it is filled with uh, uh, okay the way we uh analyze the date and say whether it is an earlier work or a later work it shows with the construct of the kavya if the kavya has a more a better flow a better rhythm then we say that it is an earlier kavya uh sorry it is a later kavya if it does not flow as much as the later kavya there can be stylistic difference there can be influence of what you have studied over the years that can also influence your writings in later stage so if you it's an earlier work you want to show more of your prowess you want to show that you are unique you want to show that you are better than what they have written before especially 
for a person who has come in the 17th century, he has to face uh, um, great giants like Kalidasa or, or uh, you know, the Vedanta Deshika, who was also in just a few centuries before. So for him to distinguish himself, he in the initial first two uh, uh, kavyams he wrote with long samasas and anuprasa, yamaka and all that. He tried all the shabdalankaras. So shabdalankara is that which beautifies only the shabda, the words. Arthalankaras like upama, uh, rupaka, everything beautifies the artha. Right? This one falls somewhere in between. I would say one of his earlier works, yes, but it is definitely after Ganga Tarnam or Shivalila Arnama. And uh, the topic he takes is uh, Samudra Mathanam. Uh, it, uh, the, the fourth Ashwasa deals with that. Uh, I'll just give you a brief uh, um, of all the five Ashwasa. So there are five chapters in this. Chapters can be divided as Adhyaya, Adhikaranam, um, Kanda, like in, uh, you know, Yuddha Kanda, I mean, in uh, Champu Ramayana, you have, because Ramayana itself has uh, the Kandas as chapters, the name for the chapter, I mean. So he, he divides it as Bala Kanda, Mayodhya Kanda, Sundar Aranya Kanda, Sundar Kanda, and all that, Krishkinva, like that. Here he takes it as Ashwasa. Ashwasa means just chapters. So Pratham Ashwasa, the first chapter is there for your syllabus. There he starts off with the description of Amaravati which is the Devapuri, then he goes on to Indra Varnanam, then Durvasa comes in. When does the Samudra Mathanam start? The story behind it is that Durvasa arrives and uh, Indra, at that point of time, he climbs on to Airavata and he starts going out of Amaravati, his city. At that point of time, Durvasa comes to see Durva, um, Indra. He brings a, a, a divine garland which is the prasadam of Narayani, Kalika, uh, Shiva's uh, consort, Kali. He brings a, a prasadam from her and that garland he wants to give it to Indra. So Airavata just takes it, throws it down and uh, smashes it with his legs. Now Durvasa, as we know, he is uh, uh, very famous for giving out curses at, at a moment's notice. So he gives us the shapa. He says, your might will all go down. You will become, you will be reduced and you will have to go into hiding. And you will be won over by the asuras. So that is the whole shapa. Then the devasura yuddham happens because at that time, point of time, he loses his uh, strength. And uh, uh, the asuras are always ever waiting to attack and they attack them. So the yuddham happens. Uh, when the yuddham happens, the Indra and everybody, the, all the devas, they go into hiding into M M Mandramala. Okay? Um, you know, the mountain that is taken for the Samudra Mathana. Then the story we know that uh, they go to Narayana, they ask his advice, then they uh, do the Samudra Mathana and all that. So it is described in five chapters. You can look at uh, uh, the contents also. This first Ashwasa has 51 shlokas. Um, I don't know how fast or how slow it will go. Let's see how it goes. Uh, we'll go straight into the text. The Mangala Shlokam is Vande Vansita Labhaya Karma Kim Tanna Kathyate Kim Dampati Miti Bruyam Utaho Dampati Miti. So the Swarupam of a Mangala in any Kabhyam, Padya Kabhyam because uh, Gadhyam may or may not have um, Mangala Shloka. Uh, in general, you can or cannot have Mangala Shloka. It depends. We start off with the Mangala Shloka so that there is a good ending. And Mangala Shloka can be of three types. Ashihi, Namaskriya, Vastu Nirdesho, Vapitan Mukam. This again is a definition given in Kavya Darsha. Uh, Ashir, Namaskriya, Vastu Nirdesho, Vapitan Mukam. Uh, and he only gives it for Padya Kavyas, if I remember right. I think at the beginning of his definition of Padyas, he gives this Kavyam Kalpantarasthali. Uh, yeah, okay, that's fine. Ashihi. Ashihi means Ashirvad Rupam. So next is Namaskriya Rupam. 
next is namaskriya is i pray to this lord uh, and then vastu nirdesha is whatever is the um, kavyartha suchakam that is your hero or the heroine nayika nayaka or the, the the theme of the poem anything can be put forth in the mangala shloka hmm? so it can either be ashirvada so several people write only one shloka there are people who write four in fact in kadambari gadyam there are some 25 shlokas as uh, 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 mangala shloka we never read all the shlokas we only start off with the gadyam mostly in kadambari uh, some because you can't just continuously say 25 shlokas every class you start off with the mangala shloka every class you start off with 25 shlokas that is it would take you 10 minutes right so uh, we start off with the gadyam in kadambari in this it's very difficult to say whether he is saying namaskriya or vastu nirdesham i i would say in the shlokam he does both uh why i am saying that is um hold on this conference will now be recorded he starts off with ashir namaskriya vastu nirdesho vaapi tanmukam this starts like vande that word itself you know it is a namaskriya so it is a nati roopam mangalam nati uh, nati means uh, namaskara roopam mangalam uh, vande i bow to him whom so first before that he says vanchita labhaya why do we do mangalam why do we pray to the lord vanchita labhaya whatever i wish i need to get it right so vanchita labhaya in order to attain what i wish what i desire i bow down and when he is saying that he has to give a karma or an object of his namanam of his namaskara what is the object that he is going to say karma kim tat na kathyate uh, karma kim what is the object do i use so you have to say like bhagartha uh, samprutto uh, bhagartha pratipattaye jagatav pitarau vande parvati parameshwaro so in raghuvamsha in raghuvamsha when kalidasa starts he says vande whom whom do i pray to parvati parameshwaro that is the karma of the sentence aham vande i bow it's a subject you have an uh, you have a subject you have a verb what is the object of the sentence it should be some devata somebody so karma kim tat na katyate karma kim what is the karma what is the object of the sentence uh, tat karma kim na katyate i don't know why i i am not able to understand what i should say as the karma now what is his dilemma that he faces he says kim dampatim iti bruyam uta aho dampati iti now the point here is dampati the word dampati is a nitya dvivachana word so i started off with saying it's he's got a chamatkara way of saying a lot of things he's got is a very sarcastic uh, person huh? so do i start off with saying dampati in his mind his ishta devata is parvati and parameshwara right so he started off with the, uh, i have to bow to parvati and parameshwara if he started off very normally like kalidasa he could have said parvati parameshwara vande but what did he have to do here he is saying i am looking at ardhanari swarupa so ardhanari swarupa half is uh, um, um, no half is uh, parvati and half is shiva now do i call them in singular or in double so dampati is a word where is that ah jaya cha patihi cha dampati it is a nitya dvivachana antah now when i say dampati vande that's how i have to say right now do i call them dampatihi in singular because i see only one shariram in front of me or do i say dampati if i say dampati then what i see in front of me is not dual i don't see two people i only want to pray to ardhanarishwara if i use the word dampatihi then it is an apashabda look at the force of uh, uh, his training in vyakarana and he uses it humorously to suit him right so kim dampatim iti bruyam do i say dampati if i say that it is apashabda udaho dampati iti or do i say that it is dampati if i say dampati then i have to see two people in front of me right so vande vanchita vanchita labhaya 
karma kim tanna katyati he sets the tone for his uh, um, kavyam you know by saying that for me it is the ardhanari swarupa not only shiva you may think that it is nilakantha vijaya but the nilakanthasya vijaya the the, pa, the even the word nilakantha suggests that parvati was the one who made it for him right he was only shiva until parvati came and stopped that visham in his kanta and that is why he became nilakantha so the shakti is always there behind him right uh, if you are if you know saundra lahari it is shiva shaktya yukta yadi bhavati shakta prabhavitam he cannot move without shakti so there is shiva shakti abedam is what he sees every day right that's why the confusion ah ah dampati hi now the kavyartha suchanam here is so nati roopa we we uh, concluded that it is nati right it is namaskaram na aashir namaskriya vastu nirdesho in that it is the namaskriya type of mangalam what and it is also vastu nirdesha because he is talking of his confusion between the nilakantha and uh, you know the shiva and shakti he wants to pray to uh, parameshwara who is in the ardhanardi swarupam and it is dakshayani said i specifically mentioned dakshayani because it is before parvati right the samudra mathanam happened before that so she is still dakshayani in that form and hmm? it's because of dakshayani that he got the name of nilakantha and he also talks about the hero of his uh, uh, poem the nayaka of his uh, champu in the mangala shloka right now let's go to some aspects like alankara here you have kavilinga alankaram uh, the kavilingam is because you know um, he is not able to say the object of the sentence and the because he is not able to say the object of the sentence he has to give a reason for that kavilinga alankara samarthanam uh, uh, you have to justify your statement that poetic justification is called kavilinga and this karma kathana asamarthyam because he is not able to say the karma why is he not able to say the karma the explanation is given in the second line where he says it is either a shabd uh, the uh, apashabdam or uh, uh, the uh, i have written brahma tattva aikyam it is more uh, the shiva shakti aikyam hmm? shiva shakti aikya swarupam that is the sandeha that he has that is the dilemma that he has and that dilemma justifies the point that i cannot say an object right uh, that justification is present so it is kavilinga alankaram and of course since we are talking about the sandeha that is there between whether it is a, uh, a how, do i use uh, a, a wrong usage wrong grammatical usage or do i talk about the ardhanari swarupa that sandeha also prompts another alankara called sasandeha alankara now this kavilinga and the sandeha alankara cannot exist without each other they are codependent and since both these alankaras are codependent it's called mishra alankara and that mishra variety is called sankara the kavilingam and sasandeha alankaram are uh, um, intertwined here and so it is a sankara alankara okay um, think we have time only for this Oh, okay just a few minutes on dhvani um i'm not going to uh, say a lot about dhvani because you you still don't have that exposure for what it is and all that you will know about it later in uh, uh, pratavradriyam um it, it, you have three different types of words and meanings Uh, the first set is words and then the meaning you have is primary word and the primary meaning i say vande then it means i i pray you have the vand dhatu has a primary meaning which is namaskriya and that is called vachaka shabda and vachyartha the primary meaning of a word and uh, uh, of a word and its meaning that is your first uh, step the next you have something called lakshana for which i have to go in detail let me not go into that the third variety is called vyangyartha vyanjana is the process through which we know the meaning of a word now in this uh, um, uh, for example if i say gato astam arkah that's the most popular example that a lot of people say 
in the sense astam uh, surya astam gachati if i say surya astam gachati gato astam arkaha what is the meaning each one will get i am looking at the sun and i am admiring the beauty of the sunset and i am saying uh, uh, surya astam gachati or it's just a plain statement but there are several people who can take different meanings from it a child can understand that okay i have to go back home i should not be playing outside or a brahmachari might say let me do some dhyanam or a, a, a husband who is working he can think that okay i have two more hours to work in the office and then let me go home right so there are several meanings that each one can get from this one sentence and those other different meanings are called vingyartha in a kavyam this vingyartha or suggested meaning plays a very very important role and that increases the beauty or that is the very soul of the poetry kavya syatma dhvanirita budaihi yas samamnata purva right from the stage times of uh, mahabhashya dhvani or when they were searching for what is the meaning of a word that is when the the, the concept of dhvani started formulating and in the in the sphere in the field of alankarikas the concept of dhvani became um, uh, attained a very great importance to the to the status of being a soul or atma it is the atman of a kavya everything even if you don't have alankaras even if the words are bad even if whatever it is if there is a beautiful dhvani or if the the rasam uh, is suggested in that shloka that is enough for me right so keeping that in mind we try in a kavyam as a whole you try to understand what the what is the rasam that is conveyed by the kavya in this kavya it is shantarasa uh, so everything goes towards uh, that uh, um, what to say i don't want to uh, translate it as peace you know it is such a not fleshy word that's what i feel peace is so dry whereas shantarasam has so much of uh, um weightage to it na here uh, even though the dhvani and based on uh, the kavya's rasa the poet is so beautiful to even uh, it has so beautifully brought in that dhvani even in the first shloka so when you look at this he can only see brahma tattva or shiva shakti aikyam shiva shakti aikyam as far as shakta goes shakta tradition goes and brahma in uh, in advaita tradition if you look at it brahman is like shiva and uh, shakti is like maya swarupi look at saundarlari uh, gira mahur devim druvina grihini agamagido hare patnim padmam hara sahachari madritanaya the turi hare hare patnim padmam hara sahachari madritanaya turiya kapitvam duradigama nisima mahima mahamaya vishvam bhramayasi parabrahma mahishi parabrahma mahishi you are like the concert of uh, parabrahma swarupa and you uh, uh, that is maya you are maya swarupi he talks about shakti as the maya swarupa she is maya she is parvati she is lakshmi and she is saraswati and shakti is different from all of this hmm? so shiva is different from the sada shiva it is uh, um, it is a, a different philosophy and different branch of learning by itself i don't want to go too much into that there if we want to talk about brahma tattvam we cannot describe it properly because it is vacham agocharatvam i cannot it does not come within the range of speech at all that is why he is saying akin dampatim vidhi bruyam what is the object of my prayer what is the object of my prarthana do i say dampati or dampati so i am not able to express that tattvam in words that's what he is trying to say here right so brahma tattvasya vacham agocharat in tamil we have a, an expression kandavar vindilai vindavar kandilai the one who has seen it cannot talk about it one who is talks about it has definitely not seen it as far as brahma tattvam goes hmm? kandavar vindilai kandavar means the one who has seen vindilai and uh, uh, cannot talk about it kandavar vindilai vindavar kandilai 
the one who talks you know those people who give speeches and speeches about you know the atman is like this you know it is nishkriya nirguna you can talk hours together but you have not it just shows that you have not experienced the brahma tattva even once it includes me <laughs> so brahma tattvasya vacham agocharatvam that is what he is being he is trying to convey vande vanchita labhaya karmat kim tanna kathyate kim dampatim iti bruyam utaho dampati iti any questions i'll stop with this hmm any questions okay and the my professor would say only only two people can have no questions either you understood everything that i said or you didn't understand even one word <laughs> i i would rather take it as the former <laughs> okay if you go go back listen to it if you have any doubt then come back uh, next class we can address that okay uh namaste what is this your conference will now be recorded illa rendu the kavyasya atma samay varum adla rendu the kechin vacham sita amishayen padala samay kanna ama so appo and edhume ava vandu anivachaniyama edhume illa adhiyum sonna adhiyum appo solli na kelipitten so and அனிர்வச்சனியமா <laughs> <laughs> in that particular shlokam let me describe what that is see it is kecham they are saying that dhvani uh, uh, some people say oh, oh okay okay I, i understand what you're trying to say so if you say that dhvani cannot be described you cannot describe the nature of dhvani no you can describe the dhvani that's what they are saying right that's true correct then eh? it is only only exists for dhvani don't bring it into brahma tattva in brahma tattva la unakku vande anirvachaniyam da ma adu na vande brahma swarupama irkena adanudaiya if i have to describe the uh, uh, the experience that i have had in its entirety i cannot use words and describe my experience that is for advaita whereas in kavyam as far as dhvani goes i can clearly say that dhvani happens because of this okay i can give a reason and there is also another if i cannot give a process for that dhvani that is called asamlakshya krama dhvani the moment you say a shloka that at that moment i can understand the the idea behind it if i if i say the shlokam jeevatsu tatapadeshu navedara parigrahe um, um தேவிஸ்டிவாரிங்கிங்ஸ்பான் that is the vachyartham there and the moment you hear this there is a nostalgia which is the dhvani illaya and the feeling avand onaku vandu adu vanna you can say you can't say it is anirvachaniyam again you can describe why you have that after some time definitely but at the same time brahma tattvam you can describe it but you can't describe it in its entirety right yes. and ha ah, as far as advaita goes anirvachaniyam stands whereas as far as dhvani goes you don't need to say it is anirvachaniyam you can say asamlakshya krama that is why there is a classification of dhvani saying you cannot understand the process probably but there is a process 
it is like you have hundreds of uh, um, uh, lotus leaves and you take one sharp needle and just poke it immediately goes to the other side can you explain the process that happens no you can't you can probably not see it in clarity and the mother if we are uh, you know super fast like flash we can probably see the process maybe not <laughs> sorry it means so dhvani can be explained it can be defined dhvani as such is not anirvachaniya so only in advaita that you have the anirvachaniya you can't say that even vidwan vidwan if you are a vidwan you can explain the brahma tattva no vidvatvam is different from uh, uh, moksha or brahma sakshatkar yes yes clear okay